Well, Bolly, you're a galera, I guess, to Firkin Fulcher, Carmilla Magia, Sucked and Firkin Fulcher, Tarish, Rum Hain, I guess, Rhythmoth and Kayla Sivin. I'm very glad it's on order, I guess, pleasure them at the Hill of Gorman and you. So, I wear a I wear a Loch Gorman, it's a Corlori mayor, and members of the Oroctus, uh, councillors, distinguished guests. And above all else, uh, uh, splendid artists who have just performed. Uh, it is. Uh, there is no more splendid use of your talent than to recover an important piece of history, that it is important that it be not lost. Remarka. That it is important that it be not lost. May I say at the very beginning that uh, I'd like to thank the Mayor of Wexford and Councillor David Hines for inviting me down here to come and inaugurate this a public work of art marking the centenary of the Wexford lockout of 1912. A historic struggle that you've just heard secured a return to work for those involved and a vindication of the right of workers to establish a union to represent all foundry workers. And I think it's splendid that this very fine piece of sculpture will be there as a reminder to, of into the future, travelling from one generation to another, both of the importance of work with one's hands, that is the work of the foundry worker and the work of foundry workers in the past, but also of a great struggle for the right and defence uh, of work. And I know that Wexford Borough Council and its centenary committee had been working hard to commemorate the strength of the workers, their families and the community, and the origins of foundry work in Wexford. <coughs> I should say that it was very interesting as a youngster, I remember, in County Clare, uh, in the fields before uh, people abandoned uh, intensive agriculture of any kind. You'd see pieces of equipment with the word pierce written on the side of the ploughs, written on the sides of harrows and on the sides of seed distributors and so on. So in a curious way, the events that you've just heard reenacted were ones that were quite extraordinary. The land had been inherited by people through the different land acts and particularly through the 1906 land act which transferred a great deal of land to landholders for the first time. Decades earlier, the agricultural workers carried the greatest brunt of the famine and the greatest brunt of the post-famine migrations. And at that particular time, the agricultural labourers would find the greatest difficulty in achieving not just recognition of their union, but decent conditions of work. And in the foundries that made the equipment that would go in time to all of the graziers and to the different people who took land from them, standing behind it was the labour of the workers in Wexford. And they... I think when your committee was looking at it, a very good friend of mine, the late Mike Linwright, had written Men of Iron, Wexford Foundry Disputes, 1890 to 1911. And I know that booklet was published by the Wexford Council of Trade Unions and the Wexford Historical Society has to be commended for republishing Michael's monograph. May I say a word about this because it is a matter of some comment that arises regularly as we head into a period of commemorations. There will be many and I as president will be speaking at different ones and there is indeed a committee of government to look at how we might be sensitive and appropriate in celebrating commemorations and I very much subscribe to that. The one thing we cannot do is to affect some kind of amnesia and leave people written out of history as if events never took place. Rather, what we have to do is we have to be able to go back and realise that there are different narratives of different times, particularly in relation to the division unification of this country. Place them side by side with respect, be open to revision where new facts and new material is available. And then after that, put ourselves in the place of the other. 
and then in time move on and so but what we cannot do and nor should we do is ever forget the extraordinary courage of those who all that they had was their labour and their work and who wanted to combine together to express that in solidarity and that is what is happening today I think that it is very interesting that was reference has been made to labour history and the Labour History Society is very, has worked very hard but it is not just an academic and intellectual discipline it is one that really is something that for example sits side by side with the struggle of workers in the United States, the workers in different parts of South Africa in different conditions. These are, it's part of global history. And one of the most interesting things about the Irish period, and I will be speaking about it between now as we see this as a great and splendid rehearsal for 1913, something that drew the attention of writers and intellectuals outside of Ireland, such as George Bernard Shaw and others, but also very importantly involved families. It, it set up something interesting, a choice that sometimes proved unfortunate, which was that you had to choose sometimes between your class, your nation, a version of home rule or your religion. And these great projects were sometimes used to divide uh, people whose common interests would have been served by a society built on justice. This is Peter Hartnett's work. And is there anything more appropriate than somebody who worked for over 30 years in the engineering industry could in fact could make this piece that will be there and it's an enduring tribute to him, his life and the kind of work he represents. I think that let's give him a round of applause because it's his piece of work. There's something very symbolic in its own way even about this. It is that a person who is in fact, and you saw images in different times of people beating on the anvil and so forth. You can do something that is useful and functional in a forge, but you can also think about making something beautiful. And it is after his 30 years' work that Peter, in his own way, set out to follow his passion for art and sculpture. And as the minister in my day in the past, who introduced the 1% scheme for public, for public art, I can think of no more splendid example. I think it reflects not just his own background as a factory worker in steel, but as a Wexford man, and as an artist, and as a trade unionist. Framing an iron gate at the entrance to a foundry, one that is chained shut reflecting, as I said, the infamous lockout in the town's three foundries. I think the events in this town 100 years ago marked a significant development in the rise of a whole new era in the history of modern trade unions. The struggle to extend union organisation for the very first time to the mass of unskilled workers. These workers were refused the most basic rights, including the very right to organise. Working conditions were often very poor and wages were extremely low. Of the thousands of manual workers in Ireland, Many worked a 70 hour week for as little as 70p. And you know, when I was listening to these great speeches, so well delivered, I pay tribute to you, to, to you all, I thought of the case being made for the one big union as well. When I came back from uh, Britain, and we came back from Manchester University in 1969, I joined the union myself. I founded the teaching section of the Workers' Union of Ireland. And we founded that union because the, so that the ground staff would be, on, would be in it and the laboratory technicians. And also, then eventually, there was, of course, the Irish Federation of University Teachers that was being organised by Cader Asman at the time. So we set off on a tour of the country. And I ended up with everyone below associate professor, and he ended up with everyone from associate professor up. But the whole fact of the matter was, so that when issues came up, that we saw them as collective issues. And this collective power is still important. And all over the world on a day like today, we should realize that it is one of the most fundamental breaches of rights to refuse the right to join the union. 
and Wexford's industrialised character. Locked as it was away there, these machines were made, pieces of equipment, moved out of Wexford, and they were used by people who sometimes were putting the new property before issues of family or issues of solidarity with workers. And that was the problem, the division of people with the common experience of working. I think Wexford is also unique. It's a splendid town. But the reason, I suppose, it had the tree factory was that there was a seafaring and trading link with Bristol. The foundry industry had become well established by the end of the 19th century. There are many objects, the beautiful objects made, that we know that have come out of that period. And the three foundries, Pierce's foundry in Mill Road, the Selskar Ironworks and the Star Foundry, as I have said, really provided most of the agricultural machinery machinery needs of what was a, prim, a, a tillage county, but also, of course, supported a thriving export trade to wild markets. The traditional exclusivity of the earlier organisations of skilled artis artisans had begun to give way to a more generous recognition of the essential solidarity of all wage earners. I said when I came back from Manchester in 1969, the very first research project I had was work on Galway docks and representing the dockers section. It was the time, I think, really, when the transport union, as he was then secretary, would almost, in fact, take go to bed early for a fortnight to get ready for the annual general meeting of what was then called the dockers section. And really, Gilbert Lynch, who is my predecessor as a representative, there was a big uh, for as Labour TT for Galway, had that particular charge as well of representing the docker section. A branch of the National Dock Union of Dock Labour had been set up on Wexford docks nearly 20 years, more than 20 years before the lockout. In 1890, just think of it, how advanced they were. It was only one year after the union had been established in Great Britain. And in June 1911, just one year before the lockout we are celebrating here now, the dock workers became the first members of the Irish Transport and General's Workers' Union in Wexford. And after that, the iron workers in the foundries were joining that union. The foundry dispute stemmed from the dismissal of a known union member by Pierce's foundry in August 1911, as you heard, and it would continue until the following February. The recourse to a lockout on the part of the foundry owners was a, 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 a preemptive blow aimed at ensuring that the newly emergent Irish Transport and General Workers' Union would not get itself established in the industry in Wexford. Rather like the phrase, we don't want that kind of thing here. We are all one, friendly, family, so on. The result was that over 700 men were thrown out of their employment and indeed, as you have just heard, in the course of the conflict that followed, Michael Leary, an innocent bystander, died in September 1911 from wounds sustained in the baton charge. But what was interesting in this prolonged dispute was that there was a background of an upsurge of trade union activity among several different categories of workers. People who had worked on sea, seamen, dockers, carters, all associated with the docks, and railway workers throughout Great Britain and Ireland. And the action then of the Wexford employers in combining together to pose a concerted opposition to the new union was of course a rehearsal for what would follow in 1913, in the 1913 Dublin lockout. And the commitment then of the people you have seen represented so well and deeply this afternoon, the leadership of James, James Locke and James Connolly and P.T. Daly, they all addressed meetings here at this spot at the fight. And I think that it is very important for us to remember that. And they spoke of, of developing a new model of trade unionism from its more sectional predecessors. And people often forget that about the trade union movement, is that it always has to reinvent itself to take account of new circumstances and new conditions. And what set it apart was the vigour of its industrial action, its mobilisation of all sections of general workers to support other workers in less strategic positions. And that wonderful thing, remember, it is at the time when property ownership is literally flowing across Ireland. The famine has removed a huge section of the people and immigration more, nearly two million. 
and now, if you like, consolidation of holdings is taking place. And it is at that time that they decide to stand together in advocating the principle, as you have heard that, that an injury to one is an injury to all. And you know, as someone who has written, if you like, about the history of shopkeeper grazers or whatever, it's the great credit of the shopkeepers in Wexford at the time that they're giving credit to those who were locked out was one of the reasons that the strike, that the lockout, that the, the whole action was able to be sustained. As well as that, James Connolly paid tribute to Corla Line that come and Lucas Gale, to the Leinster Council of the GA and to the local teams, Wolf Tones of, and also to come and Lucas Gale, their head and Koshlon, Castle Bridge. And they organised games in support of those who were locked out and parades to draw attention to what was at stake. And Connolly also said was, has gone and went on on several occasions to salute the local organisational effort of Richard Corish, who had previously been employed as a skilled fitter at the Star Iron Works before becoming an activist in support of the new union. James Larkin and Connolly had been invited by Corish to stay in his house in William Street in the course of the dispute. And at its conclusion, as you have heard, he was appointed the president of the Foundry Workers' Union, which did not take long to be absorbed back into the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union. And I am indebted to Kieran S. Roach's account in his biography of Richard Corish, which tells then how that was the start of moving on from that activity to politics and securing a seat on Wexford Borough Council a year after the lockout concluded in early 1913 and went on to be elected Mayor of Wexford in 1920. In 1911, Richard Corish, of course, was convicted along with the other activist, Richard Furlong, and the Irish, TD, the Irish Transport General Workers' Union organiser, P.T. Daly, you have heard about preparing for when he comes out, for actions taken in pursuit of the dispute. And when you look at the police reports in the National Archives, what one finds is the authorities in 1911 had barely come to terms with the relatively recent status of legality granted to trade unions by a series of enactments culminating in the Trade Disputes Act of 1906. <clears throat> It had been recognised basically in 1906 that there was a right at stake. But remember, this confrontation was taking place six years afterwards. There are the odd people who still say that even though the law is there and the right is guaranteed and expressed in law, that one can choose to ignore it. And that was the background of the events that we are commemorating today. Their activities had been removed at last from the ambit of criminal law and could no longer be automatically deemed to constitute conspiracy or a, a restraint of trade. The new labour law reforms created a legal framework for industrial relations that was to remain the basis of modern Irish trade union law for over 80 years. And that's an important part of our history, as important as the story of our independence or the other stories, and that's what I mean by a narrative that is to be added to the other narratives. And in James Connolly's address to the workers following the settlement, which allowed for a return to work, with the establishment of a union for all the foundry workers. He told the workers, as you have heard very ably put, that they were returning to work as a body united, joined together, realising what their position is. One solid body to act in unity for a common purpose. So the achievement of the Wexford foundry workers, Augustomic Chirkt Kondera, was in fact in securing their right to have their own union. It anticipated the guarantee that would come later in Bon Rock and Hare in the 1937 constitution for the right of citizens to form associations and unions. Freedom of association is also guaranteed in a number of international instruments which the state has ratified and which it is therefore bound to uphold under international law. The objectives upheld by the Wexford people through a long and bitter struggle in 1911 and 12 were ultimately to be championed by the International Labour Organisation itself in 1919. 
the right of freedom of association and the right to organise were given specific and detailed protection by the International Labour Organisation in Convention 87 of 1948 and Convention 98 of 49, both of which have been ratified, I am pleased to say, as President of Ireland by Ireland and now constitute a cornerstone of the social dimension of the European Union. Now, Peter Hotnet's fine memorial then, it attests to the spirit and resolve demonstrated by the people of Wexford in support of the foundry workers a hundred years ago. You can all be proud of that support. The strong engineering tradition created in Wexford by the three foundries is still evident today. The rights do not have to be a choice between rights and skill. The skills are recognised and former employees of Pierce's are now employed in local companies such as Kent Stainless, Ace Compaction and Killan Engineering. These companies manufacture products that keep the traditions and skills of iron and steel workers alive today and instead of going to the fields they go abroad. So the Wexford lockout is an important chapter of Irish labour history. The struggle required great courage, commitment and solidarity from ordinary working people. I should say before I finish, I'm so glad that so many people are here from all the different communities and I didn't recognise and should recognise the presence of the Minister here, Minister, Minister Brendan Allen, the Chief Whip of the Government and members of the Corporate Council and so forth. And people who, have, who are all simply activists <coughs> and participating citizens in Wexford. We should never forget that as Irish people we benefit to this day from the changes that these people fought so bravely for. And today as we face difficult times in our own times, I believe that the Irish people have the same determination and resourcefulness to bring about positive changes that can to help to create a society that we can be proud of. An inclusive citizenship in a creative society. An Irishness that we can be proud of at home and abroad. Such an inclusive society as is built on participation, equality and respect, based on the important values of participation, respect for all, and fairness. We wish him our privilege to and thank you very much. Garimila Mahatikal.